Hello, this lecture is on emotions in the brain. So, we all know what emotions are, right? We feel them uh, in, in the daily situations, you know, very often and we express them in various ways. So, suppose you are happy, that you smile a lot and you wave at people or if you are sad or even grieving, you probably, you know, you shed tears or you weep, right? Or if you are angry, you might you know, shake your fist and bang on the table and scream and so on and so forth. So, emotions and there is a feeling that goes with emotions and there is also an outward expression in the form of body language or facial expressions and which is a good thing, it is a convenient thing especially when in social interactions because you know what the other person is feeling based on the emotional expression, right. And suppose you, you want to go meet your boss and ask for a pay rise and if you cannot read the meaning of that you know frown on your boss's face with the eyebrows like going at an angle, uh, then you will be in trouble, you know your request will be turned down and or, or there can be a negative reaction. So, uh, but thing is the emotions that we in ordinary people like you and me feel in our day to day life are, uh, there, there could be a wide range of them, but it is very hard to define them very clearly because there is something vague uh, and inexpressible about emotions, right. And, uh, and also in emotional expression, ordinary people may not be able to uh, distinguish and produce very fine shades of emotion in terms of facial expression. So, for example, it may not be very easy for you know, somebody who is not trained to show uh, the difference between uh, jealousy or resentment or gloating, right? It's, it requires a very uh, some kind of a training to express those kinds of emotions, uh, which is what actors do. Right? If an actor uh, cannot show difference between you know jealousy and resentment, right, uh, or sadness, then uh, he would not be in business for too long, right? So therefore, uh, it's not enough just to have a vague idea of what emotions are, right? You need to make a science out of them. You need to have a complete list of all possible emotions. And you should have a clear understanding of how to express them, right, in facial expressions and uh, and body language. So in liberal, in arts, theatre, in acting, uh, you have to have a clear understanding uh, of the science of emotions. In philosophy, also uh, people have speculated. Philosophers have speculated about everything under everything under the sun. So they have uh, written a lot about emotions, the nature of emotions, and things like that. That here again there is a, there, there is a metaphysical intellectual philosophies and also religious philosophies also have talked about uh, emotions, especially in religious philosophies they talk about what are the kind of emotions that you know take you to the, to the goal of religion which is you know right, reaching God or something like that right, and what are the kind of emotions which uh, you know uh, take you away from that and what are bad emotions, good emotions and things like that. In psychology, psychologists also are concerned with emotions because uh, there are some emotions which are you know, uh, so uh, normally a person is supposed to have uh, right, a healthy uh, emotional condition, right, which is necessary for to live your life. So what are the kinds of emotions which are healthy and positive, what are the kinds of emotions which are negative and harmful for your health, right, you need to have an understanding of that. So psychology studies emotions as a science. Then emotions very often there are two sides to emotion, there is a subjective side where there is just a feeling of emotion and then there is an objective side uh, where it is expressed in behavior, right. So you want to understand the relationship between the inner feeling and the external behavior. So uh, you can study emotions from behavioral point of view also. In addition, since this course is basically about neuroscience, it is not about psychology, it is not about you know, philosophy. So uh, what are the neuro, neural or cerebral underpinnings of emotion? So exactly what happens in the brain when you when you are happy or when you are sad, what happens in the brain, how does, uh, which parts of the brain are active or participate in a certain emotion. So these are some things that uh, neurobiologists you know, talk about. So basically emotions or a science of emotions can be approached from different points of view, right, philosophy and arts, uh, psychology, behavior and finally uh, neuroscience. So in this lecture, we will talk about all these four components of the science of emotion. Uh, let us begin with uh, philosophy. Right, how are emotions discussed in philosophy? So let us begin with Indian philosophy and in Indian spiritual tradition there is lot has been said about emotions, uh, particularly let us start with uh, Bhagavad Gita, right. In Bhagavad Gita, they, you know, it mentions uh, uh, six emotions uh, which it describes in kind of negative terms, it calls them the six inner enemies, uh, right. The, the Arishad Varga, Ari is uh, enemy and Shad is uh, six and Varga is a class or a type, these are the six types of inner uh, enemies. Right, these are desire or kama, uh, anger or krodha, uh, greed or lobha, right, delusion or moha, pride or mother, right, and jealousy, matsarya. 
So, Gita says you know warns the seeker right of perfection uh, against these inner enemies and you know it, uh, it uh, urges the individual to uh, identify these emotions and try to rise above them to transcend them and reach a certain state of you know, tranquility. So, that is the typical you know undercurrent that you see in, in Gita. Now, also in Patanjali Yoga Sutras right uh, emotions have been mentioned and, and uh, described. So, two major emotions, the two polar emotions, the raga which is love and dvesha hate right, your attraction towards something or you know your revulsion towards something uh, are, uh, are called kleshas or afflictions of mind. So, basically the yoga sutras say that they are bad for you right, stay away from both ok. Uh, both, so normally people think love is good and you know hate is bad, but right yoga sutras say both are emotions, both bind you to you know, objects of either love or hate. So, rise above them because they are reflections of the mind. Now, emotions are, so emotions if you look at in religious philosophies, so they, there is a kind of a note of uh, you know, negativity about them because uh, typically in Indian philosophy, Indian uh, spiritual philosophies, emotions are considered as something something negative and something that have, have to be transcended ok. Whereas, uh, you cannot afford to do that in aesthetics right or in drama and dance and, and these different kinds of art forms you cannot afford to put down emotions or look down upon emotions, you have to give them their rightful place and in the scheme of things and be able to deal with them you know uh, properly in a scientific fashion. So, if you look at Indian aesthetics right in Natya Shastra which is the science of dance, uh, this is based on a book written by the sage Bharata right, it talks about eight primary rasas. Rasas in, in common parlance is uh, translated as soup, but here rasa means essence or it is a essence of experience. Uh, when you you know sublimate experience, what what do you have? What are the basic elements or essences of experience? So, Nadi Shastra talks about eight primary rasas. These are love or sringaram, humor or mirth, that is hasyam, fury or raudram, compassion or karunyam, disgust or bibhatsam, then horror or bhayanakam, valor, viram, and wonder or At a later point, somewhere around 8th century. Uh, another uh, emotion has been added to this list of eight rasas uh, that is shantam or peace. And then subsequently two more have been added, these are vatsalyam which is a kind of a love or a solicitude that a senior person like a teacher has towards a junior like a you know like a disciple or a student. And then bhakti uh, which is you know the same love which is directed towards God ok. So, this so we have a list of uh, 11 uh, emotions that in Indian aesthetics. So, this picture shows uh, how different uh, emotions according to Natya Shastra, uh, particularly this is uh, from the tradition of Bharatanatyam, right. How can these emotions be enacted uh, in, in dance forms? So, Indian theory of rasas has another interesting side to it. It associates these uh, rasas with a deity or a god, right, and also a color, ok. So, associating um, emotion with a deity is, is interesting as an aspect of art, but it is kind of off limits for a, for a science like neuroscience. But association of emotion with color is very interesting because a lot of western science, the western treatment of emotions also represents emotions on some kind of a palette of colors right, which is very convenient way of uh, representing the internal relationships, the interrelationships among various emotions. So, we will come to that later. So, in Indian theories of theory of rasas, the Sringaram is associated with the god Vishnu right and the, with the color light green and the Hasyam or mirth or comedy is associated with a god named Pramata right with whose color is white and uh, Raudram right the presiding deity is Rudra right. In fact, the word Raudram comes from the word Rudra and the color is red right and so on and so forth. So, it is very interesting that the emotions are associated with gods and also different colors. So, there is lot has been written on emotions even in the western tradition. For example, Aristotle has written a lot about various aspects of science uh, extensively has also given kind of a list of emotions. He named a lot of emotions like for example, anger, mildness, right, love, enmity, uh, fear, confidence, shame and its opposite shamelessness, uh, benevolence, pity, indignation, envy, emulation and contempt ok. So, you can see that uh, different authors have you know, at, at various epochs in time have proposed different lists of emotions and there is a little problem with that because there is no nothing standard about these kinds of lists of emotions. Spinoza who is a Dutch philosopher of 17th century uh, has stated he has emphasized the role of cognition in emotions. In fact, this is a question that we will come to 
uh, it will return to again and again in this talk. Right, but the problem is different authors have given different lists of uh, emotions, but there is nothing like a universal list of emotions. Okay, a lot of these uh, lists are based on subjective speculation, so the, they do not have the kind of a strength of universality. Now, emotion and facial expression, so a lot of study on emotions right, has depended on spatial expression, because in philosophy people depend on their you know uh, introspection and you know subjective analysis and you know things like that which cannot be considered as proper methods of science, because science depends upon objective measures, objective measurement. So, if you just give a list of uh, emotions because you feel them that way, we feel, you feel they are universal, then that is not really science. So, if you give a list of emotions, you should map them on to something objective, something you can measure and see. So, one way you can measure emotions, since you cannot, you cannot really understand what the other person is feeling. The only thing that you can understand or measure is what other person is showing right in the form of facial expressions. So, uh, people have tried to classify facial expressions and map them onto emotions and a lot of work has been done on these lines. And earliest work of this kind has been done by Charles Darwin who is also the theorist of you know the theory of evolution. Uh, he Darwin noticed that you know it is uh, that emotions are expressed in facial expressions and a lot of the facial expressions are universal and it, they are not only universal among humans, right, certain facial expressions are shared between animals and humans. Okay, so, look at uh, this example, right now here is a snarl that is seen in a human and an animal and you can see that bearing of the canines and lifting of the ends of the upper lip and so on and so forth, the, you know the, the kind of stewing of the eyebrows, right, you can see the parallels between the ex, this kind of an expression in a man and animal. So, what Darwin says about this kind of a mapping? is that the movements of expression in face and body, uh, whatever their origin may have been, are in themselves of much importance for our welfare. They serve as the first means of communication between the mother and infant, because, because of the facial expression right or bodily expression of emotion, you can convey your emotion to somebody else, that will facilitate uh, you know social interaction. So, therefore, they serve as the first means of communication between the mother and her infant. She smiles approval and thus encourages her, her child on the right path or frowns disapproval. We readily perceive sympathy in others by their expression. The movements of expression give vividness and energy to our spoken words, right. They, they reveal the thoughts and intentions of others more truly than do words which may be falsified, because what you are saying is, is, is accompanied by movements of the hand or movements of your facial expression, then it has more vividness, it has more impact on the listener than just uttering the words without any uh, emotion in them, without any warmth or color in them. Okay, so, so, with the, this as starting point that is the idea that facial expressions uh, reveal emotions, a lot of workers have worked on that and tried to give classification of emotions. So, Sylvan Tompkins uh, presented one such classification, uh, he proposed a concept of an effect. So, emotion has as we already mentioned has two sides to it, there is an outward expression of emotion and then there is the inner feeling. So, inner feeling is something that is known subjectively only to the person, the subject right, so you cannot really build a science around that. But the outward expression, right, uh, or the biological side of expression, right, that is what is defined as affect in Sylvan by you know Sylvan Tompkins. In fact, there is a whole field of neuroscience called affective neuroscience, which deals with emotions as they are expressed in the nervous system. Okay, so the effect is uh, is defined by Sylvan Tompkins as a biological portion of emotion. Okay, it refers to hardwired, pre-programmed, genetically transmitted mechanisms that exist in each of us, which, when triggered, precipitate a known pattern of biological events. So, he is talking about the neural underlying machinery of uh, emotion expression and emotion generation. So, based on his uh, analysis of facial expressions, he gave a list of emotions and these are uh, surprise, joy, interest, fear, rage, disgust, shame and anguish. And he further classified his emotions into neutral, positive and negative. So, surprise apparently according to him is a neutral emotion and joy, interest are positive emotions and fear, rage and others are negative emotions. So, Paul Ekman also has uh, studied facial expressions and gave a given the classification of emotions and the list that he has proposed consists of you know surprise, happiness, anger, fear, disgust and sadness. So, thing is some of these previous classifications, these lists of emotions right, they, they, they do not really tell you how those emotions are related to each other. Okay, so, for example, uh, love and hate are opposite emotions, but if you give a list of these things, uh, you do not know that they are opposite. So, similarly, amazement and astonishment 
right are shades of the same thing you know different intensities of the same thing if you just give them as a list uh, you won't understand the interrelationships so similarly people have found that uh, to to express the relationship in terms of positive and negative or opponency between uh, emotions and also the different shades of intensity of the same thing people felt it is convenient to describe uh, emotions in terms of color you know, right and it's interesting that in indian theory of aesthetics uh, people have also have associated emotions with color but that, but that uh, mapping is totally different from the kind of mapping that you are seeing here on this slide this uh, map of colors of emotion was proposed by robert pluchi and you you see look at a, actually a very simple map here and this has been further elaborated in more complex uh, color maps that pluchi had proposed so in this picture you can see that uh, joy and sadness right joy is in the red side red and sadness is in kind of purple uh, they are in oppo the opposite side so that indicates that joy is opposite of sadness then acceptance and disgust you know you accept is you're attracted towards it you welcome it and then disgust you kind of push something away so they are also opposite then fear and anger are i don't know uh, it's not very clear why they are opposite but uh, so fear is uh, you want to run away from something right in anger you want to act on something and harm something you know, okay so in that sense probably they are opposite then surprise and anticipation so if you are expecting something that is anticipation and you are not expecting something you suddenly springs upon you and in a surprise and that is surprise uh, so you can see how in this very simple palette of colors uh, different emotions are placed Uh, with respect to their interrelationships further on the circumference you see these other terms like you know submission and awe and disappointment uh, which indicate combinations of emotions like for example at the top you have love and love is according to this picture is a combination of joy and acceptance because joyful acceptance of something is is something that you call feel as love and submission is acceptance and fear and uh, acceptance but without uh, joy right with with fear right is submission or surrender and awe is a fear with uh, surprise and uh, disgust and remorse is disgust with sadness so and so on and so forth so you can uh, see how he is trying to build some kind of an algebra of uh, of emotions uh, where emotions are expressed as colors so pluchik also uh, published more complex uh, color charts like this and these are with like wheels of color as so where you can distinguish between the primary colors and the derivatives and shades of emotions in terms of Uh, the you know, different in intensities so for example here in the this green petal going to, kind of to the uh, north east right you have admiration and then trust and acceptance okay uh, or the green petal going going uh, eastwards you have terror right and fear and apprehension so terror is a very intense form of fear and fear is slightly more intense form of apprehension okay so you can see the shades of intensity of different emotions similarly on the left side uh, going westwards you have rage okay which is the most intense form of the of of anger and then this annoyance which is a weaker form of anger and so on okay so it's very interesting that uh, it indicates the opposite uh, opponencies among uh, emotions the shades of difference, difference among uh, emotions also so for example here the upward petal going northwards has ecstasy and joy and serenity and the oppo on the opposite side uh, you have grief and sadness and and pensiveness okay so so you can, you can see how uh this kind of a color chart very nicely places uh the emotions in terms of their interrelationships but what is the connection between color and emotion actually colors also seem to have a very similar internal structure right as we know that if you combine r g and b red green and blue you get white now that means r plus g is equal to w minus b and you get uh, yellow okay which is what you can see in this color chart so uh in the center you see a white patch of light and that's where the blue r g and b meet right and then you have other sectors where only two colors meet so in this part right you can see uh so this is uh, magenta okay where you have blue and red meeting so r and b uh, combined to form magenta and that's equal to green uh, getting removed from white so similarly uh, red and green when they meet you get yellow okay that is like removing blue from uh, white so similarly uh, green and blue when they meet gives you cyan and that's like removing red from white and you see all these different relationships among primary colors and derivative colors right and their their complementary color colors in this uh, color chart okay so like that starting from the facial expression people have given various classifications of emotion right but that's still quite superficial because it only talks about 
how emotions are seen in, in facial expression. So, let us go deeper and look at uh, some of the prevailing theories, some of the pro dominant theories of emotions in psychology. Okay, so, previously we have only looked at facial expression, but, uh, but actually emotion is felt all over the body, right, because when you are angry, uh, you know, you are not just frowning or you know, you just pursing your lips and things like that, you are probably shaking in anger and you are, you know, shaking your fist and banging on table and uh, in addition to the outward movements of the body, you also feel uh, certain inner uh, movements and responses in the body. Like for example, your heart rate might increase, your BP might increase, you know, temporarily. Right, and so on and so forth. So, emotion is something and that is what, what is very special about emotion, right, it is, uh, its effects are seen all over the body. So, therefore, if you want to understand emotion, you cannot stop at facial expression, you have to go deeper and look at its uh, kind of an all body response. Now, so one of the first theories that talked about this bodily response of emotion or the uh, relevance of the bodily response to the emotional experience, right, uh, it was, uh, such a theory was proposed by William James who was an American psychologist who worked in the, you know, towards the end of 19th century. So, his work starts off uh, with a simple question, do we run from a bear because we are afraid or are we afraid because we run? Okay, so, the normal common sense understanding of how emotion works is that, let us say you see a bear and you are scared. So, your first uh, cause, of, cause of it is the appearance of the, of the bear or the stimulus. In response to that, you first get scared and then that fear makes you, right, uh, run away from that, uh, from the stimulus. So, the normal sequence is stimulus, uh, then the feeling or of emotion and then response. But uh, William James turns the table around and uh, gives a totally different sequence. Let us see what he is saying. My thesis or my hypothesis is that the bodily changes follow directly from the perception of the, ex of the exciting fact and that our feeling of the same changes as they occur, uh, of the same changes as they occur is emotion. So, what he is saying is, you know, to cut it, uh, make it simple, the stimulus is the bear, it first produces a response of running and it is that response in the body which is running creates a feeling of fear, okay. So, the sequence is not stimulus, feeling and response, but the sequence is stimulus, response and, fe and feeling. Therefore, he is saying emotion is somatic, emotion is something that is felt all over your body, it is not just something that is happening, happening in your head, right. So, therefore, common sense in this, uh, to continue his uh, quotation, James's quotation, Right, uh, common sense says we lose our fortune and are sorry and weep. We meet a bear, are frightened and run, and we are insulted by a rival and are angry and strike. Right, but the hypothesis to be defended here says that this order is incorrect. We feel sorry because we cried. Okay, the act of crying is what makes gives you the feeling of sorrow. So angry because we strike, because we strike and hit and scream, we feel the emotion of anger and afraid because we tremble, okay. So, this is, uh, so without the bodily states following on the perception, the latter would be purely cognitive in form, pale, colorless, destitute of emotional warmth. So, what he is basically emphasizing is the response of the body, the participation of the entire body emotion. Without that kind of a participation, your emotion would be purely, you know, mental, intellectual, right. It, it lacks the color and warmth, right, of a full-blown emotional response. So, that is a very important emphasis, uh, so, uh, but there are some issues with that, we will see that in a moment, right. Just to contrast the common sense understanding of emotional response, the stimulus first, feeling next and response later, there is a normal sequence that people believe. What James theory is saying is, stimulus first, then response of running or whatever and then uh, that creates also a bodily response and bodily response is then fed back to the brain and that is what creates the feeling in the, in the brain. Okay, so, then there is also uh, another uh, uh, researcher, Carl Lange, who also talked about the physiological responses correspond to emotions. Particularly, he emphasized the vasomotor response, that is the response of the heart and the circulatory system to emotions. So, these ideas together are called the James Lange theory of emotion. So, basically what the theory says is, there is an emotional stimulus like the appearance of the bear, which goes to the brain, which goes to the sensory areas and they get processed, right, that directly produces an activation of the body, uh, which could be external activation or could be internal like the pounding of the heart and perspiration and things like that. Then body sends feedback back to the brain and that is what creates a feeling of emotion. So, this is James Lange's theory of emotion. Later on came another theory proposed by Cannon and Bard, 
So, William Cannon developed the idea of homeostasis, which refers to the idea that certain parameters are maintained at you know at fairly constant levels in the body. For example, we know that our internal core body temperature is held at 98.4 you know, or 6 degrees Celsius. So, there are active mechanisms which try to maintain the temperature at that level or uh, your blood pressure you know is uh, the systole is at 120 and you know the diastole is at 80 and there are active mechanisms which maintain, maintain in that way. So, this is homeostasis. So, Cannon also uh, coined the term fight or flight response to describe sympathetic action. So, in certain, so this is a, so the sympathetic nervous system is actually a part of your autonomic nervous system which in itself is a part of your peripheral nervous system because we talked about the central and peripheral nervous system. Actually, we did not spend much time on the peripheral nervous system. So, in peripheral nervous system, you have the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system uh, refers to uh, the part of the nervous system which is not in your conscious control in not in your voluntary control. So, uh, here there are again two branches the sympathetic and parasympathetic. In sympathetic uh, nervous system, right, it produces a whole body response and this is the kind of response that, that occurs when you are facing a challenge and you want to either fight the challenge or flight or run away from the challenge, right. Uh, it simultaneously produces lot of you know uh, responses in different organs in the body. So, for example, uh, and the, a full mass discharge of sympathetic nervous system uh, act activation uh, is associated with uh, uh, accelerated uh, higher heart rate, higher force of contraction of the heart, right, perspiration, uh, pilo erection or what you call the goosebumps, right, the, the, the raising of hair and so on and so forth. So, all these occur simultaneously right by a generalized activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So, what these people are uh, Cannon Bard and the theory is saying is okay, we agree that there is a physiological response right in the body, but that response is not specific because if you think about it take an example like uh, a positive emotion like love. Let like imagine somebody who is trying to you know this young boy is trying to propose to a girl. So, this guy uh, got a whole bouquet of flowers and you know he has even written a poem about this girl and, and then he is, is uh, you know he is trying to set, write, uh, propose to the girl. So, uh, I mean naturally he is not going to just read out the poem in a calm in a fashion right in a stoic fashion, there is going to be some emotion. So, he is going to feel the pounding of the heart, he is going to perspire, he is going to his lips are going to dry up and so on and so forth. But imagine a totally different situation where you are suddenly walking on the road and you know you, you suddenly see a snake in front of you and with its you know the cobra with its raised hood and so on, right. You freeze in your tracks right for a moment, you, you do not know what to do and uh, again your heart starts pounding and your, your lips start drying up and you perspire and right. All these different changes occur again right. So, the thing is what is the difference between a guy who is trying to propose to a girl and a guy who is like you know uh, facing a harmful snake right. The bodily response is nearly the same because in both cases what you have is simply a sympathetic activation. So, the bodily feedback is same, it is non-specific, it is not uh, different for different emotions, okay. So, uh, then how do you distinguish emotion? How do you feel differently in case of different emotions? So, uh, so this is uh, what uh, uh, Cannon and uh, Bard series says, okay. So, so thing is where is this uh, specificity coming from? Okay, so, the Shakhtar and Singer wanted to explore that and they their answer to this is the bodily response is definitely non-specific and it is clear. The specificity comes from the cognitive aspect. So, your high level cognitive and conscious interpretation of your external stimulus right that is where that is what gives you specificity. So, to test this they have done an interesting experiment. In this experiment there were a bunch of subjects uh, placed in three different rooms right and uh, they were given an injection of adrenaline. Now, adrenaline is basically a drug which will activate uh, the sympathetic nervous system. Now, we all know that we talk about adrenaline rush that is when you are very excited right, your heart is pounding and you are perspiring and you are uh, totally excited okay. That is because your sympathetic nervous system is activated. So, so they inject this drug to activate your nervous, nervous system so, uh, for all the subjects. And uh, in the first room the subjects were ex so exposed to pleasant experience basically they have introduced actors in each of these rooms, this actor enacts something okay, uh, and different things in different rooms. In the first room the actor enacts something pleasant and funny and you know kind of entertain the crowd. In the second room the actor enacts something unpleasant and kind of sad. In the third room the actor enacts something that is emotionally neutral. So, all three of them were given the same injection of adrenaline, same dosage. So, at the end of the this experience or exposure the subjects were interrogated about what they felt 
it turns out that the feelings were cor corresponding to the situation, right? That is, the people who are exposed to the pleasant experience, right? They said, uh, I had a good time, I felt very happy, and all that. People who are in the second room where the actor did something unpleasant, they said, you know, it was very, I was very, felt very bad and, and I'm sad or something like that. In the third room where the action, the content of act, acting was emotionally neutral, uh, people said and they didn't find anything particularly, you know, in, interesting or, or emotionally significant. So, although the autonomic reaction or the response is same in all three cases, it is the high level cognitive interpretation, right, that is what is giving specificity. It is not coming from the body, from the physiology. Okay, but still there is a problem, right. If the, what these people, Schachter and Singer showed is that how we interpret emotional responses once they, once they occur. But what they did not uh, explain is why do they occur in the first place? Because you see a stimulus, you see like a bear or a snake or right, you know somebody doing something pleasant or in a sort of a girl to whom you want to propose or whatever. Certain stimuli are neutral, they do not produce any, if I, if I look at this, you know this pen, it does not produce any emotional response in me, right. So, why does, why is there a difference? What is causing this difference? Okay, so none of these previous theories talk about that. They only talk about the bodily response and then something that happens later. So, this questioning has led to the concept of cognitive evaluations and uh, that uh, gave birth to this whole line of thinking called appraisal theory. The key proponent of appraisal theory was uh, Magda Arnold, right, who actually lived a very long and fruitful life, uh, close to a century. In fact, she, Magda Arnold has seen uh, the whole evolution of the emotion, the theory of emotions over a whole century, the whole the ups and downs uh, that occurred in this, uh, in this domain over a whole century. So, her main uh, contention is that emotional feeling depends on cognitive appraisal, right. What you feel depends upon uh, how you interpret uh, the external stimulus, right, uh, cognitively, okay. That appraisal consists of basically asking the, and answer the, answering this question. So, what I am looking at, what I am facing, is it good for me or bad for me, okay. That is what is called appraisal and the key difference in appraisal theory compared to some of the previous theories is that the appraisal, although it, it depends on cognitive input, the stimulus that you see and uh, the actual appraisal happens unconsciously, okay. So, in fact, the unconscious element of emotions is very important and that is emphasized by, you know, further uh, other workers that we encounter later on in this lecture. So, although the starting point is cognitive, right, the appraisal actually uh, the proper is unconscious and that is why very often uh, it is very hard to express your emotions. You you feeling something queasy, something odd and right, you know, you just say, I you know I am in a bad mood, you know, I just want to be alone and things like that. That is because there are a lot of uh, what we call emotional experience is difficult to put in word. There is an unconscious element by its very nature. So, in the appraisal theory, uh, the appraisal part is thought to be occurring unconsciously. Now, it also leads to an action tendency that is, uh, so unlike uh, say William James who took a kind of extreme position, right, where he says the action itself gives rise to emotional experience or emotional feeling. In uh, Magda Arnold's theory, the, uh, there is only action tendency and not explicit action and that, so you want to do something in response to that stimulus because you evaluated the stimulus to be good or bad or whatever. And that action tendency gives rise to a feeling, and that is your emotional feeling. So, others have extended these ideas, uh, and in fact, uh, Richard Lazarus uh, has developed a whole theory of coping. And again, in the cornerstone of his theory is, is that emotion of this theory of emotion is appraisal. And he says that appraisal is automatic and is often unconscious, uh, an assessment of uh, what is happening and what it may mean to them, to the person, or those who care about. So, again, appraisal has to do with the question of is it good for me or bad for me or is it good for somebody I you know, care about or is it bad for them. So, cognitive interpretation of situations, right, influence emotional experience, right. Uh, so, for example, in one of the experiments that uh, Richard Lazarus has, has performed or uh, the, the subjects who are, who watch a gruesome film, uh, it is about uh, some kind of a, a gory ritual that is uh, performed by Australian aborigines. Uh, so, in one case, uh, there were also there is also a very solid, uh, a very scary soundtrack that goes along with the video. In other case, the soundtrack is you know very simple and emotional neutral. And uh, so the so they actually measured the, the autonomous response in terms of you know heart rate and uh, change in blood pressure and things like that. It turns out that the emotional response was much stronger 
in case of uh, the video when the video went along with a kind of a strong and a, a kind of a disturbing soundtrack. So, in this case the autonomic, nervous, autonomic response itself was determined by the sensory stimulus. In this theory of appraisal proposed by Lazarus that appraisal can be become more important than reality. Because appraisal is all that depends upon uh, on the sensory stimulus which comes from the world and therefore objective. The appraisal process itself is unconscious and uh, also it is completely personal. Right. Some people can take a very simple thing, evaluate it, right, or appraisal is evaluation, right. So, evaluate it in a, in a very big way. For example, you, you walk along the corridor and you feel, you know, you see somebody, you know, that you know did not smile at you, did just ignored you. And you can make a mountain of that mole, you know, of that mole hill and, you know, interpret it in a very negative way. Or somebody has just lost a job and the person could be taking it very coolly, you know, very casually, right. The appraisal is something, so the outward fact is same, right, or uh, that is an objective part of it. But your inner evaluation or appraisal of it could, could vary a lot from person to person, right. So, when, when the what we call stress is actually something that arises out of appraisal, right, uh, your appraisal or the way you appraise your day-to-day uh, -day, day -day situations. So, along with uh, you know Susan Falkman, he has written this book uh, called Stress and Appraisal and Coping. So, how does appraisal lead to stress or abnormal appraisal can lead to stress and then how do you cope with it right? uh, and how do you uh, reduce stress. So, uh, Richard Lazarus gave a classification of appraisals in terms of like you know these are again the same emotion that we have seen before, but, but his commentary on the emotion in terms of an appraisal is slightly different. So, anger is defined as a demeaning offence against me and mine. Fear is defined as right as facing an immediate concrete and overwhelming uh, physical danger. Now, sadness is defined as having experienced a irrevocable loss. Disgust is defined as taking in or being too close to an indigestible object or an idea metaphorically speaking. And happiness is making reasonable progress and towards realization of a goal. So, in all these things uh, actually in most of these uh, definitions of uh, emotions that right, what you see is something good is happening to me or something bad is happening to me or something uh, good is likely to happen in future or something bad is likely to happen in future. Okay, it is talking about an actual realized uh, positive or negative for me or at the prospect of something positive or negative for me in right in future. So, he is kind of trying to break down the whole uh, gamut of emotions into certain axes. So, we will return this to this idea later on uh, towards the end of this lecture when we try to outline a whole theory of emotions which has certain neurobiological grounding. So, basically if you look at the relation between emotion and appraisal, this emotion stimulus which is sensory stimulus which comes from the world and therefore, that is objective, but the emotion the stimulus enters your unconscious and that is where appraisal occurs and comes back up as your emotional feeling. Okay, so, that is again your uh, is conscious. Now, this uh, so there, there are two parts to emotion, there is a conscious part, there is a cognitive part and then there is a unconscious part, but it so happened that as people kept developing and defining the theories of emotion, the conscious and cognitive part started becoming more dominant, right. That is because uh, of, the, of the way in which psychology has evolved during the 20th century. In the first half of 20th century, right, we saw what is called the behaviorist revolution. Uh, because before that, people were talking about, uh, you know, when people talked about a uh, person's nature, right, or, or mind, they would use the things like, you know, instincts and drives and motivations and, and so on and so forth. But these are the abstract things, you know, you cannot, you cannot pinpoint them, you cannot observe them. But science is all about dealing with things that are observable, that are measurable and, put in a, can be, and that can be expressed in numbers, right. So, how do you express, how do you quantify and measure something like an instinct, okay, or drive or motivation. So, uh, there was a, as a reaction to those, those kinds of loose technology that were quite popular, you know, earlier in the late 19th century. The 20th century has seen this, uh, this reaction to that called the behaviorist revolution where people like you know uh, Skinner and Watson and, and a whole lot of behaviorists, they have insisted that you always talk in terms of observables of behavior. So, they do not talk about motivation, they only see okay the animal has pressed some lever 10 times. So, that is a number and I can measure that, I can observe that. So, uh, so and also the part of the reason you need a behaviorist evaluation was because we did not know much about inner workings of the brain at that time. So, there was so, people had to depend a lot on outward behavior. 
but things have changed in the second half of 20th century. Particularly what happened in the towards the middle of the 20th century is the computer revolution. So, people have begun to build these large computers that use them in the second world war and therefore, the computer metaphor became very popular, it became very influential you know thinking of the brain because people also have thought of brain as a big computer. We have seen that in the work of uh, McCullough and Pitts, they thought that brain is a big computer and neurons are like logic gates and so on. So, therefore, so that gave rise to cognitivist revolution in, in psychology. So, because because of which people kept thinking of uh, everything as a result of some kind of a cognition as some kind of cognitive processing. So, even, even emotions were dragged into that kind of a attempt right. So, there was a tendency to reduce emotions to cog cognitive analysis. So, but that robs emotions of their elusive, elusiveness, their mysterious uh, quality and the unpredictability ok. So, then the reaction again started uh, to this kind of a attempt to reduce emotions to cognitive processing and so people began to probe the unconscious roots of emotions. One of the key uh, figures who has emphasized the that the emotions are unconscious is Robert uh, J. Zung. Uh, so, uh, he said that emotional preferences could be formed without any cognitive registration of the stimuli. So, all the other theories that we have seen have said the starting point of emotion is this cognitive interpretation, but appraisal itself happens in the unconscious. But Robert J. Zunk, uh, he emphasized that you can have emotional feel, you know, feeling without any right cognitive registration of it. To illustrate this, he studied uh, what is called exposure effect. So, in these kinds of studies, uh, subjects uh, were presented certain sensory patterns, but these patterns were, were shown uh, in such a for such a short time that it is not enough for those stimuli to enter your conscious experience, right. But still, the subjects preferred patterns uh, that they were ex previously exposed to. So, let us look at some and look at an example of exposure effect. So, here in this picture, you can see two emoticons, you know, two figures one is a smiley and other is like a frowny, I mean, it shows a frowning face. And these images are shown uh, very briefly for only 5 milliseconds, and that is too brief for a person to consciously uh, realize and have an experience, uh, have an experience of what they are looking at. So, after that very brief presentation for just uh, 5 milliseconds right, uh, the images are masked by some kind of a dark rectangular mask. And after that then they show a kind of a neutral picture like a Chinese ideogram like a Chinese character. So, uh, the assumption here is you know, that actually in the experiment none of the experimenters could read Chinese. So, for them a Chinese character is just a, an emotionally neutral uh, pattern, an abstract pattern. So, after they were exposed to lots of these uh, pairs of you know, emoticons and Chinese patterns, right, then they were shown only the Chinese patterns and asked them which do you like more ok. Since the patterns are basically neutral normally you would think that they, they would not have any particular preference to these patterns, but it turns out that the patterns which uh, were paired with uh, a smiley were preferred more than patterns which were paired with a frowning face ok. So, that is very interesting which, which clearly shows that your emotional experience that you had or emotional bias that you had had nothing to do with your cognitive interpretation. So, uh, so this uh, gave rise to a whole uh, body of work uh, where people studied the this the subliminal subconscious uh, components of perception. So, in, in some studies uh, people who are given anesthesia and, and the people who are under anesthesia they were played certain uh, words uh, while they were in, in anesthetic you know anesthetized right uh, through uh, through some kind of headphones. And once they are back again uh, and in the waking condition, they were given stubs of words. So, for example, and they were asked to complete for example, uh, during anesthesia they were played this word like cordial. And after they, they were they you know became awake right, they were given a word like C O R ok and they asked them okay, will you fill them as cordial or correct ok. So, they chose cordial more often than correct because that was the word that they have heard while they were anesthetized. So, obviously, while they were anesthetized there is no conscious experience right, but uh, the words have entered the unconscious and, and therefore, that is showing up as a bias to the choice ok. So, uh, again there is a interesting book called Hidden Persuaders which is written by Vance Packard. He has uh, you know studied or uh, uh, covered the reports of James Vickery right who has talked about a lot of these subliminal perceptions or experiments with subliminal perception where they use this phenomenon for advertising. 
So, it is all these adver say advertisements, uh, they flash a very brief message, very short message only for say 3 milliseconds in the middle of a movie. So, the message could uh, go like you know eat popcorn or drink coca cola right and then in the intermission they found that uh, the sales of popcorn went up by 57 percent or coke by 18 percent. Okay, in fact, there is a when, when the society came to know about this kind of experiments or you know this, this kind of advertisements, there is a lot of uh, outrage against this and because it is like you are influencing minds uh, by playing with their emotions by without their conscious you know uh, uh, knowledge of, of that they are being manipulated unconsciously. The other phenomena in neuroscience which also talk about uh, how the unconscious uh, can also give rise to perceptions and feelings and things like that. So, for example, there is this phenomenon called blind sight, which is a kind of a paradoxical sight. So, people, uh, so we know that uh, sight requires eyes, you, know, you need to have intact eyes to be able to see something, but that is not sufficient, right. You also need to have an intact brain, you need to have your visual maps uh, to have formed uh, correctly, so that you can, you can receive the information coming from your eyes and interpret them and experience these visual experiences, right, in, in your brain. And a lot of the visual, you know, visual awareness occurs in the visual cortex, right. So, in certain patients who are said to have what is called blind sight, there, there is a visual cortical damage. So, therefore, they do not have a visual experience, there is conscious uh, visual awareness. But uh, very often they can show evidence of being able to produce visually based performance. So, for example, if you take a blind sight subject and if you say, okay, I am throwing a ball at you, can you catch it? Okay, initially the subject might say, oh, no, 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 I cannot see, you know, maybe I would not be able to do it, but uh, if they tried it, they would be able to catch the ball with a very high probability. Okay, so, similarly they can show evidence of uh, visual uh, perception, although they do not have a awareness of uh, visual experience. Okay, this is a paradoxical thing, but it is a, it's a fact and you know, it is a fact of neuroscience. So, similarly there is something called numb sense, you know, to, so you are, they are numb, they can, they, they are, there is a damage to the somatosensory cortex, so they cannot feel the touch, but if you let them palpate something simply by feeling it, they may be able to say what it is. Or similarly, there is this paradoxical hearing called deaf hearing. So, all these uh, phenomena you know, say that, uh, so there is, uh, there is unconscious sight to experience and so for emotions also you need to look at this unconscious sight. 